Thank you all for coming. We're going to go ahead and get started with the uh, Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District meeting for April 26. Uh, we're going to begin by uh, swearing in a new director. So if we can get our uh, our council to come up and uh, Mr. Larry Pagler will. Uh, I think that's a good place. Thank you. I, Larry Pagler. I, Larry Pagler. Do solemnly swear and affirm. Do solemnly swear and affirm. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution of the State of California. And the Constitution of the State of California. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Introduce Carlos Vandeberry. We'll come up and give a uh, Spanish interpretation. Carlos, can see him. He's normally friendly. Um, we'll continue on to next. Uh, the make an announcement. Today's meeting is being broadcast by Community Television of Santa Cruz, and our technician today is Mr. Lynn Dutton. Uh, this time, any uh, board of director comments? <coughs> Seeing none. Uh, any oral or written communications to the board? Hang on a second. Hang on a second, Brian. Go ahead. We had a written communication. Uh, uh, hi. Hang on, Brian. I'm gonna have, wait, 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 just a comment, real quick. No, there's a written communication that came from. Um, Joint Venture Silicon Valley um, and the Campaign for Sustainable Transportation. That's over, not the one here, but over the hill. Could we have our staff respond? Make sure that our staff responds to it. It's asking for information. But, our staff, we don't need to do it now, but if our staff will respond, that'd be great. Okay. That's all. Yeah, another. Go ahead. On that same topic, if you could just copy it. Thank you, Alex. Okay, now we'll continue with oral communication for three minutes. Mr. Peoples. Hi, this is Brian Peoples from Executive Director of Trail Now. Uh, my day job, I actually work for Lockheed Martin. Uh, I've been um, a lot of careers, environmental engineer, facilities manager. Right now, I'm a, I manage the engineering processes for the Lockheed. Um, and the unique thing about Lockheed Martin is they're a systems engineering organ company. And what systems engineering is taking the bulk of the subsystems and making a complete plan. And I want to talk that, that that's kind of what transportation is as well. And let me explain. Here in Santa Cruz, we have three corridors, Highway 1, Soquel, and the Coastal Corridor. Each of them need to be open for an effective transit system. Right now, with Highway 1, you have thoroughway. You, you want a much maximum thoroughway. Soquel, you want the light system synchronized to improve flow. Right now, from the study of the Unified Corridor study, the Coastal Corridor, the rail line, 
Five times more users would use that. 15,000 versus a train. Um, 800 per hour would use that. If you equate that to a single highway lane, a single highway lane moves 2,000 people an hour. So if you move 800 people an hour on the coastal corridor, that essentially opens up the freeway for our transit services. We really need to open up the coastal corridor. A decision by this organization and the Regional Transportation Commission to give that property to a non-local non private organization to run a, essentially an amusement park ride, train ride, for a decade. That was reducing our capacity by a third. There is a misconception that we need more transit for our mis disadvantaged. Actually, the disadvantaged, the people who need to use that corridor, are losing out. Elderly, public transit, we need to allow the coastal corridor to be open today. I was actually at the California Transportation Commission on March 13th, and their response to this agency and the regional transportation is, what are you guys doing? Why, it's been 20 years that the coastal corridor has sat as a vacant lot. They question this local agency's leadership on giving that property to a tr train operator to run amusement park trains. And that pulls money away from our needed transit. So I want to educate you all, Trail Now, to understand what's going on. They're spending millions on keeping that corridor closed. Thank you. Thank you. Marilyn Garrett, retired school teacher, part of Wireless Radiation Alert Network, and EMF aware. Walking slowly up here because I have a sprained ankle. But before I did this, about seven weeks ago, I was regularly riding the bus. And I like to support public transportation, but it really needs to be safe in terms of not getting microwaved. It's uh, with everybody on their wireless devices emitting microwave radiation. It's like everybody's smoking on the bus, which they used to do decades ago, right? Secondhand smoke, secondhand radiation, both users and non users are harmed. In 2011, the World Health Organization labeled this type of radiation as a possible carcinogen in the same category as lead, DDT, benzene, etc. So it's like involuntary exposure. I have this detector of microwave radiation and there's a sound component too. So it's very revealing. People on their cell phones or certain areas, it, it gets different levels of reading. We shouldn't have any of this exposure. Um, on buses, the bus enclosed metal places becomes like a microwave radiation. So it's even more intense. Uh, symptoms include neurological symptoms. I have tremors that my health provider thinks are related to teaching in Watsonville, Trina. <laughs> next to fields of pesticides, but I also read that the microwave radiation has similar effects on the neurological uh, system. Uh, symptoms people experience are headaches, um, sleeping disorders, fatigue, and I have a paper here I'll pass out to one of the public health warning cards and on the back, it tells you safer things uh, to use. But we, these are the facts. And more recently, the National Toxicology um, Program, part of the National Institute of Health, $25 million study of rats exposed to cell phone radiation found increased uh, brain tumors and heart tumors. 
on the bus. I'd like to see what we don't have. Smoking, we don't have cell phone use. Um, it's, uh, it's very well documented, and to pretend there's no problem when the evidence is otherwise, um, we do to our own harm. And uh, so I will pass these out. And also, uh, I want to point out firefighters, the International Association of Firefighters. Marilyn, you need to wrap up. OK, call for a halt to having antennas on their buildings where they sleep, their firehouses, because of the symptoms of being in the brain fog. Uh, thank you, Marilyn. If you have a hand out, you can give the administrator a second. Anyway, thank you. Pass these out. My name is Elise Casby, and I am a bus rider. The bus uh, is my main mode of transportation other than walking, and I take the bus all over the East Bay when I need to go there. I live in Santa Cruz in downtown. In 2016, I formed the group uh, called the Bus Riders Association of Santa Cruz. It was just a grassroots uh, attempt to protect our bus routes. They were being slashed by the new CEO, Alex Clifford who had come on a couple of years before. The first thing that got my attention about uh, Mr. Clifford's reign as CEO was uh, the paratransit, that is the people who have the least ability to walk, the greatest numbers and amounts of uh, mobility issues, people might be in wheelchairs or walking with walkers, uh, their services started to get cut. And so I started to pay attention because I am a political activist and an environmental I have great hopes for the public transit systems of this country to meet the problems of um, climate change. And I am also a labor activist and very interested in that. And that's mainly what I'm here to address today. What I began to see after 2016, after many of our routes were heavily cut, such as Route 3, which I take to go to my bank over at the Safeway off Mission Street, and other services out there, I began to see that many times drivers were arriving late with the bus, and I started asking the drivers why that was, because service had always been fairly prompt. And they started telling me they were going from having just worked one route to needing to get on another bus a totally different route. I heard this repeatedly again and again and again. And so I just want to say that I think one of the problems that we're facing here with the bus company is that the new management is diminishing the bus company in every way. There is an attack on our labor base of the bus drivers. And I feel that this has been uh, extremely cynical in recent days when I heard about a letter that Mr. Clifford wrote being placed directly on the buses that essentially blames the bus drivers for taking too much sick time, and that's why there are service disruptions. I just want to say that this is the most, as I said, uh, it's mean-spirited and cynical. It went right onto the buses, and although I didn't see it, it could have really uh, promoted a very kind of negative view of the bus drivers. I really hope that this Metro Board will start to look into the privatization move, the incredibly large salaries that management is making, and compare that to the drivers that they have been uh, working for a great deal of hours with thank very you. little pay. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Anyone else like to speak? If you'd like to speak, you can go ahead and line up at the back. That way we know who's going to be coming up next. Thank you. Go ahead. Welcome. Well, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. My name is Rachel Spalding, and I'm just going to speak generally about the EMF um, radiation. And uh, Verizon has put 
proposed to erect over 80 new self, self facilities in Santa Cruz County. Local officials have admitted that the telecom industry plans to install more than 40 small cell antennas per square mile in our community, in front of our homes, in all of our neighborhoods. With the collusion of federal, state, and local governments, telecom corporations are permitted to violate our health and safety with ever increasing levels of microwave radiation called EMF. Thousands of existing U.S. cell towers violate federal emission limits, some by as much as 600%. Thousands of peer-reviewed studies by scientists, independent of the industry, conclusively prove serious long-term health effects from current exposures to wireless technologies, especially for children. These include cancer, neurological disorders, ADHD, ADD, heart disease, DNA damage, diabetes, headaches, and insomnia. New generation technology, 4G and 5G, is exponentially more harmful as it uses shorter microwaves with, and differently pulsed frequencies. Please join your neighbors in resisting this cell tower rollout. It is up to, up to, up to us to protect ourselves, our children, and our environment. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak? Seeing now, we'll go ahead and like to respond to two comments. Mm -hmm. we'll go ahead, briefly. First, uh, Mr. Peoples, Brian Peoples, certainly has the right to express his views about how we should use the coastal corridor. That's his free speech right, and I think we, we all respect his right to say that. What he doesn't have the right to do is misrepresent what happens, the uh, facts about what happened at a meeting. We have the full support of the California Transportation Commission. You know, uh, I'm speaking here not so much about the transit district because we don't control that decision, the RTC, Regional Transportation Commission does, but um, at that meeting, they made it very clear that they appreciate the fact that we're gonna have a transit option on that corridor, and it's not gonna simply be a pedestrian path or a recreational path of some kind. And the reason that it's taken so long to get something done on that corridor is not because nobody cares about it, but because we have no funding to do anything. And the only reason we have any funding right now for actually building the path that he wants, I mean, it's not exactly the path he wants, but a pedestrian path, <coughs> because a private group, the Land Trust of Santa Cruz County, donated money to, to, to actually pay for the, the work that's being done, plus the money we got from Measure D. So it's simply not accurate that the uh, uh, California um, uh, Transportation Commission is upset with us about our work that's going on over there. And the question of EMF, uh, the uh, uh, cell, cell tower issues. Unfortunately, I, mean, I, I think there's a serious concern to be uh, addressed here. It's not that I think this is trivial or that people are, uh, you know, uh, strange or crazy to think that we should be concerned about some of these impacts because I think they have not been adequately studied. Unfortunately, however, the federal government has made it very clear, it's in federal law, that local government has absolutely no control over any impacts of environmental or health impacts of, of this radiation. So people need to talk to their federal representatives about that problem. The transit district doesn't control that, the city governments don't control it, and the county doesn't control it. Nor does, in fact, the state of California control it. It's a federal issue, and people have had these very valid concerns ought to raise them strongly there. It's a waste of time to bring it up with us. Even if we were persuaded that we shouldn't have Wi-Fi on our buses, which I think is not the general view, we wouldn't have the legal right to not do it because of the health concerns. Thank you. We'll move on to uh, written communications from the MAC. Right. <clears throat> okay, this time, uh, labor organization communications. Good morning. James Sandoval, General Chairperson of Smart Transportation Local 23. I represent the hardworking drivers at Metro and Lyft Line in Santa Cruz County. I want to speak on the newsletter that was recently put out by our CEO, Alex Clifford, regarding service disruptions and placing the blame on drivers using their protected leaves. Alex failed to highlight or mention in that letter that Metro has many employees here working 10 to 15 hours a day, every day of the week, to help with service. 
A huge factor in service disruptions is Metro's inability to recruit and retain employees. For example, we lost five out of the six drivers in this last class, and now we're down to just one. At the moment, we're trying to recruit another 12 operators, and this is proof that we're understaffed. Maybe it's because at In-N-Out Burger, the starting pay is $16.50, and ours is still $15.67. That's a problem. Another factor for service disruptions is we have operators willing to work extra, but Metro runs out of buses. Our operators are responding well to the need of covering service by staying longer or coming in earlier. Our drivers should be commended for being so overworked, yet still willing to help keep the public moving. Our operators have long showed a commitment and desire to provide a high level of service to our community. Let's not forget that just a few years ago, we surrendered our cost of living for four years and volunteered our time at Cabrillo to help Metro get a contract to reduce service cuts. The letter Alex put out placing blame for the lack of service on sick and protected leave of bus operators does not take into account the burnout factor of the many operators who work so much overtime and sacrifice their personal life and family time to provide a level of service unmatched in the area. These drivers are so burnt out they need to take the rightful leaves. If the drivers are using their protected leaves, they need that time off and shouldn't be working because anything that can impair the driver's ability can jeopardize the safety of the public. In the letter, the CEO, and I quote, to encourage our bus operators to consider help bridge any gaps by co in, in coverage by accepting overtime. This shows a disconnect between management and reality. Management chose again not to acknowledge that our operators are working seven days a week. This public letter highlighting only those drivers who were on some type of leave while intentionally failing to recognize any of the many operators who worked their legal maximum limitations as drivers, we understand our commitment to the public and we take it very seriously. This is not only a job for us, it is who we are. Metro is one organization with one goal, the outstanding care and transportation of our community. This organization should be working towards that goal in everything we do, rather than looking for scapegoats to avoid the issues that currently keep us short of our goals. Smart Local 23 is honored to serve this community as we have in the last 53 years and looks forward to working with Metro management on these issues to continue providing top tier service to our community. And by the way, the letters I'm referring to were distributed on all our buses by management and the passengers are reading this letter with the finger pointed at our drivers for the reason they are late to work or missed their doctor's appointments. Given that assaults on bus operators have increased across the nation, we don't need letters like this distributed to the public on the bus that could cause a conflict between the bus operators and the passengers. Thank you. International Union representative that's assigned to this local as well. And I just wanted to come forward at this time because um, it, it's, a, it's a problem. It's a problem when management points the finger at any individual employee of this company as far as the service failures. You have service failures with delayed buses as well as, as um, absenteeism. And people are allowed to be absent and they're allowed to be sick and they, that should be taken care of, that should be respected, not, not put out into the public arena to point the finger at an employee that may be off for whatever reason that they are off. If there's an issue with attendance at the transit district, it would have been a much better process for management to work cooperatively and in partnership with the union in order to discuss and dialogue about why things like this do occur. Most of the time there are different issues that come up whether it's a holiday time or it's an, an actual sick time, but to accuse people of being abusive and point the finger at them and put them in harm's way at the public arena is not a good practice. It isn't a good practice for this transit district. This district has been a lot around for a really long time. And to violate that respect and responsibility towards your own employees is a violation of every driver across this country. Assaults are up nationally. 
Federal government is looking at assaults on bus operators specifically. And for our agency to disrespect our employees the way that they have is a real problem. We're going into negotiations coming up. Why would you want to set a tone that was in conflict with your own employees as we're moving forward? We should be moving forward as a partnership, not as a disrespectful agency. This agency has known that your drivers are some of the best drivers in this country. We have a tremendous reputation out there. And it is an ill, Ill situation when management conflicts with the employees to the level that they did and that they put them in such harm's way in our community and the public when responsibility is across the board. It's across the board. Whether it's the inability to hire or inability to maintain a level of drivers that's necessary for this company to operate properly, those are issues. They all need to be addressed. But you don't put an employee in harm's way ever. That's a true violation. You don't threaten a union about speaking in reference to an issue that's come up that puts our operators and our drivers in ill's way. That's disrespectful and it is not appropriate as a management moving forward with a group of people that need to be able to work together. And um, I thank you for your time and Larry, nice to see you again. Welcome back here and welcome to the other folks that I haven't seen in a while. Thank you. Certain members of the community, my brothers and sisters, who have taken time out of their busy schedules and turned down overtime to be here today. I want to thank every one of you for being here because you understand the commitment it takes to provide this service, this vital service for our community. I want to make it clear that across the board, in every department of this company, we have been understaffed. My coworkers and I have worked tirelessly seven days a week, 10 to 15 hour days, selflessly sacrificing time away from our friends and our family to ensure that our commitment, that our, to ensure that our community can make it to, to work on time, can make it to their doctor's appointments on time, so that they can go out with their families and enjoy a day at the beach. Which brings me to my next point. We are family here at the Metro. Multiple generations have worked for this company. Grandparents, parents, their children. My father has worked here. Now I'm working here. James's grandfather retired from working here. Now he's here working. Aunts and uncles, nephews and nieces. This has become a company for families to come and make a living in this community. and to place the blame solely on drivers, and to insult their work ethic for taking the deserved leave, the earned leave, it, it not only offends our current drivers, but it offends multiple generations of families. The sacrifices that they've made, the families that are sitting at home waiting waiting for the drivers to come home so they can at least tuck them into bed because they haven't had the time to play, take them to the park or take them out to the beach. It's, it's not right. It's not right, but we do it. We do it for the community because we're proud to serve, because we, we want our community to thrive. We want our neighbors to thrive. Thank you.
Uh, we are pretty upset about it. And uh, you know what, when I get in the bus today, it's just like any other day. Smile on my face, all our other brothers and sisters, and you know, I'm just gonna keep moving on. That's all I gotta say. So I gotta get back to work. Everybody have a good day. <laughs> Anyone else like to speak on this topic? Going once? Okay. Yeah, thank you for your comments. I appreciate it. And for showing up today. Okay. Um, any additional docu documentation supporting agenda items? No. Okay, it brings us to our consent agenda. These are items we normally deal with all in one motion. Is there anybody from the board who would like to pull anything from the consent agenda? Yeah, I have a question. Sure. It's for our uh, fiscal year 19 proposed capital project. What's the item number 10 10 9? 10 9. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Are we uh, approving both attachments or just attachment B? <coughs> Sorry. Um, at the capital campaign committee, I had some questions too. The difference between attachment A and attachment B are quite significant. See, do, you want to, do we want to pull this? I think we would pull it for a quick, uh, quick summary of the differences. I was satisfied with the explanation at the capital campaign committee, but it is. Yeah. Are you going to give a brief explanation of that? I'm going to have him give a brief explanation. If that's insufficient, then we'll pull the item and we'll deal with it later. But I'm going to have him give a brief explanation. In the name of brevity, uh, first of all, the initial attachment A was an allocation from the federal government that was made on day X, as it is every year. We allocated our projects over 450,000 about four or five months later. The federal, excuse me, I have a cold. The federal government uh, upped their allocation for the year. So attachment B is the larger sum, 596,000, and we reallocated projects to a larger list. So the first list A is sort of irrelevant because they replaced it with a larger funding amount. Really, did that answer your concerns? Well, no, not really. Okay, you know, we're going to go ahead and pull this item and we'll, we'll bring it up. Uh, let me see where I'm going to place this. Uh, um, no, I'm going, to, I'm going to move it down. We're going to do it, uh, we'll make it 18A. Okay, we're all going to be here for that. So, any other items? On the Briefly on that. I, I'm going to be. I don't know how fast it's going to move along. But oh, that's right. You're going to be leaving. Okay. No, tell you what. Then I'm going to, I'm going to, we're going to move it up to uh, 12A after the CEO's report. Okay. And I'll okay. just say, Barrow, in preparation, um, as you well know, quite a few items dropped off of A, and there were new items on B. And, and I think just a, a quick review of. No, we'll, 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 Barrow, be prepared to give us a little in depth, okay? I'll give you a little while to do that. So uh, with that, any other items on the consent agenda that would like to be pulled? Not to pull, but just a quick comment. Sure. I found the... Um, Which item? 10-2. Um, the minutes of the Metro Advisory Committee were really interesting, and it was clear that there was some... There really was really good engagement from that committee, good comments, good observations and recommendations. Very helpful. I, I think it goes without saying that everything we get from the MAC has always been very yeah. insightful. So uh, that's a great I just comment. To call it out. No, it's great for you to acknowledge that they do hard work on that committee. Um, okay, so anybody from the public like to pull anything on the consent agenda? See no. I would. I would. I would. I just. Marilyn, which item are you looking at? Uh, come on up. No, come on I up. I think it's ten oh seven regarding the. Pretty sure it's 1007 regarding the surveillance cameras on the bus and um, being able to install more. I want to tell you, as a citizen in a supposed democracy, and somebody wrote a book called Surveillance Capitalism, 
I feel like it is very anti-democratic and intimidating to be on surveilled everywhere we go all the time. And I also wonder about the electromagnetic frequencies from these devices on the bus. There's big money in these surveillance cameras. I think, uh, you know, people reported when there was an accident or a crime before without spending close to a million dollars. I, excuse me, no, you've asked to pull the item and then I... I oh, I just sir. wanted to comment. And that's all you want to do is make a comment? Just make a brief comment. Go ahead and, with your comment. And I wonder, I take the 71 bus, which goes from Watsonville through Aptos, as you know, to Santa Cruz. There are a lot of people of Mexican descent who ride the bus. And I wonder if that's decreased. I think with what's going on with immigration uh, and with the Trump administration and people being rounded up who are Mexican descent, I think this is additional intimidation that's unnecessary, that's a waste of money, but it's big money for the surveillance uh, corporations. And I, I am very appalled and opposed to having this with our on our public buses. That's my comment. I'm just going to attempt to address that really quickly. Um, it, the uh, introduction of cameras onto the bus, and I, I will stand to be corrected if I'm wrong on this, but it's something that not only management, the board, and I think the bus drivers all appreciate. We've had a series of recent accidents, which every one of those accidents has vindicated and validated that the bus drivers were not in error. And the activities that happen on the bus, I think this affords the bus drivers protection. And the board is unanimous on the uh, having these cameras on the bus and management, and I believe this is something that this uh, company all benefits from. So with that, uh, any other the public want to pull an item? Yes, ma'am. Uh, can I treat the item that you're just now addressing the cameras? <clears throat> Briefly. Are you asking if we can pull it from the consent into the public agenda? No, you can make a comment. Okay. As a political activist, I am extremely concerned about being watched by the cameras on the bus. I think we all know that in 2016, the buses were the site where I was able to speak to the public about the issues. The fact that the cameras went in after that, are just it's just interesting. I'm not saying that there was a direct correlation. I also just want to say that I'm not sure that the so-called crime or the incidents on the buses uh, justified the expenditures for the cameras. I want to remind the company and the public that there are places in Santa Cruz that are no longer serviced um, by the bus, especially in the mountains, poorer areas, and actually under the 1964 Civil Rights Act, I understand that the company is possibly vulnerable to being sued under that act for removing some of those bus routes. Those people have no transportation service if they don't have a car in many of these areas. So to spend that money, that amount of money, which I've heard is quite high, I can't even remember the figure, it's, it's millions, I believe. Um, uh, but it is a lot of money, it's, you know. Um, for a service that is potentially unnecessary, what my question is, is, is it really protecting the drivers or is it more about trying to uh, police behavior in a way that's targeting bus riders, poor people, uh, people who might have challenges, for example, mental illness challenges. And is it, was it really, really necessary at a time when every single $10,000, say, for a driver's pay or to get more buses or to get more vans, um, was it really justified to get that system? Now, on the positive side, I have been told by drivers that the union made sure, or I think it was the union made sure, that, that if they did look into the photographic record of the cameras, 
that it would be in a discreet way. But my concern, again, is to echo my uh, the previous speaker, is just that this is another way to kind of monitor civilian behavior. And in a, in a time when we have very few places where we can have any free speech at all, for example, the quarry on the, at the university, to have a table there, a community member needs to pay hundreds of dollars just to have a table there. So I just wanted to say I'm concerned about some of the other factors that go along with surveillance on the bus. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments on anything on the consent agenda? Director Rocker. I'm going to say, first of all, I've been a member of the ACLU Veteran Civil Liberties Union since I was 12 years old. Our, our policy with these uh, cameras on the buses <coughs> includes that we, we don't sort of just randomly look through them looking at <coughs> issues like what people are saying on the bus or whatever. We, we inspect these after an accident or when there's been some incident where somebody attacking a passenger is attacking another passenger or attacking the bus driver. Um, and they really are for the safety of the drivers and for the other passengers on the bus. And in fact, they save us. First of all, the cost is not in the millions. It's in the thousands, not in the millions for these cameras. But the reality is that they actually save us millions of dollars. Because I'm sure everybody in this audience understands what happens when a public agency gets sued by an individual when there's been an accident. The jury feels deep sympathy for the poor person that got hurt, whatever, and we, we they feel like we have a deep pocket and can afford to pay a bunch. So if there's any ambiguity about who caused the accident, we're going to end up paying. The public's going to end up paying for that. And these cameras that save us, you know, we had a recent accident. I don't give any details of that one, but there was a recent accident where clearly the bus was virtually stopped when somebody rear-ended the bus, and the camera shows that as cameras actually show that really plainly. And when you go to court and you're trying to, and the jury's sitting there thinking, gosh, the, the, you know, this poor person in the car got hurt, in fact was killed in, the, in this uh, one accident. Uh, the, was the bus responsible? Can we make her, can the bus company pay for her family's needs or something? And so I'm taking a little bit of time here to point this out. The cameras don't cost us money, they save us money, a lot of money, because these suits are rampant in the public sector and kind of it makes a difference. And our policy, in response to the civil liberties concerns is not to go through the pictures and go looking for what are people up to or generally it's sort of surveying the public. It's to respond to accidents, incidents that where we need to protect ourselves and our drivers from the, from the uh, uh, false claims that people make against the district. I will move the remainder of the consent agenda. Motion by Rocket, second by McPherson. Oh, the exception won't be yeah, 12. Uh, uh, 10.09 has been moved. So, uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The majority of the uh, consent calendar carries. Okay, I'll take us to our regular agenda. Um, we have a, a longevity award for Juan Gallegos Belmars. Is he here? Oh, there he is. Um, do we have that? Okay. Our chair's going to our chair's going to deliver the actual uh, uh, plaque. So this is an award for Juan Gallegos Bel Belmares, 15-year uh, Metro employee, paratransit operator. He was hired by the Metro in 2004 as a vehicle service worker. In 2012, Juan became a paratransit operator. In his free time, which you know not a lot of given working for this district for sure, <laughs> he enjoys soccer, playing the drums, and spending time with his family. Juan's been happily married for 17 years, and he has four children, three boys and a girl. We're really proud of the work he does for this district. I want to say thank you, everybody, for being here. I want to say thank you to the board members, managers, and thank you for our operation. Uh, thank you for supporting me and, and helping me in the moments you need help. So it's been a long journey, and I'm happy, and I'm proud of this company. And it's a good company. No, but no, but no, nothing is perfect, but it's a good company, and I'm very proud and happy. And thank you, everybody. Thank you, my brothers and sisters here, representatives, and 
thank you for everything and thank you Cyril, thank you Daniel for uh, supporting me and, and thank you everybody. I'm happy in 15 years. I'm getting old. <laughs> <laughs> Chair, directors, a uh, number of items I'll cover as quickly as I can. Um, we do want to, as usual, we talk about uh, new hires and promotions. Uh, as you saw in some previous items, we have uh, met Marquez, who was uh, uh, hired on as a provisional employee. He's helping in the planning department. And Jason Burns, who you, you met, I believe, last month, as a provisional administrative specialist, helping us move some projects along uh, where we have capital money. Uh, new hires, Jamie Jones, Administrative Specialist, and uh, promotion by qualification, uh, Daniel Zenet Zenteno, apologize for messing that up, promoted from Mechanic 1 to Mechanic 2. So always good to see internal promotions. Uh, those are exciting for us. Uh, I'd like to also point out that uh, we have completed our recruitment for the HR director. And uh, I'm ha happy to introduce you to somebody I think you already know, Don Perme. Don, would you mind standing up? So Don has been with Metro for about a year as the uh, deputy HR director. And uh, she has 20 years of HR experience in the private industry. <clears throat> she started in high-tech computer industry, spent some time in the staffing industry, and then 14 years at last, her last company, uh, Wholesale Plumbing Industry, as the HR manager. She holds a bachelor degree in business administration with extra studies in human resources. She's mostly proud of being uh, the mom of three sons who are currently attending college. Yeah, it's always exciting to see the kids go off to college. Um, Cal State, East Bay, San Jose State University, and De Anza College. Um, she, interested, uh, another interesting side note, she's from the Bay Area originally, San Jose, uh, born and raised, and also has a couple of years as a child here in Santa Cruz. So Don uh, did very well in a nationwide competition for the HR director, and through that process, we found out we had a uh, highly qualified candidate right here in our own backyard. Congratulations, Don. Couple other things I'd like to, more than a couple, a few other things I'd like to talk about. Um, the Touch a Truck is here in Scott Valley at Sky Park this Sunday, and as usual, we'll have a bus there. So we always like to display, and and uh, it's a great event for people to bring their family, their young children, and they, <coughs> they get to experience all kinds of interesting vehicles, including our own bus. Um, our marketing manager, uh, our actually marketing director recruitment has been completed. Uh, we have hired an individual who will be here starting work on May 13th, so at your next board meeting we'll introduce her. Uh, I do want to point out that we've been notified by Cabrillo College that uh, as a result of enrollment being down, they will have to decrease the contribution towards uh, the services they have historically purchased. While we're still working with them on that, it looks like at this point that it is about $200,000 a year reduction in service. That's unfortunate because that'll, that'll lead to us having to decrease uh, two, two bus operator equivalents of service on, on that particular line that they purchased, as you recall, back when we did the uh, comprehensive operational analysis. Um, on, the, on a good news side, we did hear from the FTA in the last week uh, about our uh, drug and alcohol audit, and I'm happy to report that the Federal Transit Administration has found the Metro to currently be in compliance with the federally mandated drug and alcohol testing. So yay and kudos to Don for helping get us through that successfully. And then uh, on the heels of that, we received another notification from the FTA, uh, although this was expected. Uh, they are letting us know that uh, this is the year of the triennial review. As you know, every three years the FTA comes in and uh, goes ex uh, through our records extensively to make sure we're in compliance with all of their guidelines and rules. That, that because we've received federal funding, 
Um, so we have a package that actually we started on months ago uh, that is due to them on May 9th and then sometime later this year, probably around summertime or soon thereafter, they will be on the property for uh, an extended period of time going through the Trent and Gale Review. Um, and then last, we uh, have an impending deadline, May 15th, for a federal low-no grant. And we are submitting a $1 million grant for a fast charger at Watsonville. As you know, our uh, first vehicle that arrives from Proterra early next year, zero emission bus, is scheduled to be on a circulator route uh, to be finalized and completed uh, and put into service early next year in Watsonville. And if we are able to secure this grant, we may be able to keep that electric bus in service more as a result of doing some fast charging at the Watsonville Transit Center. So we hope we'll prevail in that grant. If you, you never know. Uh, we won a Lodo grant in 2016. Maybe we're due again. Mr. Chair, the directors, that concludes my report, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions, uh, Director Myers? brief update on the EcoPass program specific um, to that coming online for down, uh, downtown San Francisco. Absolutely, and I see Barrow moving. He is, he is our point person on that, and uh, we know the City Council of Santa Cruz has approved the funding for that program, and uh, as usual, the devil's in the detail, and Barrow's working on the details. So we have news for you, but I'd love to hear that. I'll make this pretty quick. Uh, we are currently working with City of Santa Cruz staff. We're basically going through the logistics of the contracts that will bring to both our board and the city council that you know formalize the arrangement of us providing them slightly more than 4,000 annual bus passes to the approximately 4,000 employees who work in the specific parking district one in downtown. For that, the city of Santa Cruz will pay us approximately $311,000. During the year, a one-year pilot project uh, directed by the City Council, we will monitor the use, the volume of use, what routes to use, what times of days, nights, etc. And at the end of the first year, the city will decide how to go forward. From a staff perspective, we'd suggest this is probably, don't hold me to this, a fall kickoff, and that makes some logic of the time of year, students coming back to use CSC, etc. So it's all a go, it's all going to be good. And again, the reminder is this is a follow-on from a model that happens in a number of big American cities. So it's all good. I have a quick question. Once we, we, we're in the process of purchasing a system that will allow us to know where every bus is and who gets on and off and where they get on and off and so forth, how will, how will we give the city information about where people are going to these passes before that system? Great question, and I don't want to bore everybody with the detail, but let me, what Director Rotkin was referring to the fact that, as we all know, we're about to acquire automatic vehicle location system, which is your phone tells you where your bus is at any time. However, we are not purchasing yet because of its cost, the automatic passenger counting feature. So let me set that aside. So that AVL system will be in place by late fall, which will tell Metro internally how well it's timing trips between each stop. I may be allowing eight, excuse me, we may be allowing eight minutes today for a trip between point A and point B, but after we get hundreds and hundreds of examples of the real time, if it's nine or 10 minutes, we'll reset the schedule. The more important thing to the public is, starting at two or three months later, once we prove the data works, that's when people will go to the phone and go, I'm looking for Route 71 and I'm at a bus stop number 1107. Oh, it'll be here in four minutes. So setting that all aside, coming back to the original <coughs> question, the product that we will be providing to the city is a smart card that when people get on the bus, they will tap it. That registers what route it was on, what trip it was on. Doesn't It time stamps it, but since there's not an off to match it, so basically what the city will learn is, wow, 400 boardings yesterday on Route 71, 200 boardings on Route blah, blah, blah. It's by day, et cetera. Just uh, timing-wise on the contract, is that you're, you're looking for fall to come, that will come back to you? No.
Dodo, we hope to get to our two bodies June, possibly, and I'm talking about the bus pass, not the AVA yeah. project, but between the mechanics of buying the product from the vendor, loading the technology, we, we're hoping as staff for an October start, but your coincidence of your question, we just had a long working session two days ago. Any other questions we'll see here? Okay. Uh, I just want to make one closing comment uh, for Don. You know, uh, just want to acknowledge that I think it's good for any organization to have someone work up to the organization and promote within. I think that's that's great for you. And we all know, the board knows that you've been doing the, the, the majority of the lift for the past year, and I appreciate your efforts, and uh, maybe this is a good reward for that. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Item 12A, and so before we, uh, just a real, what I'll have to do is if you have a specific question for Barrow, that might help him to explain, because he did try to give the overview and that didn't get to what you wanted, so go ahead and give him your, your uh, question. Yeah, um, my concern is, that, of course, like uh, Director Matthews indicated, was there's uh, various items that were dropped from uh, attachment A, and, and then other items that were attached to item B. And, and it, this is an example, you know, item six on a business copy machine uh, that no longer is on item B. <coughs> and also with uh, Paracuse, the, the MVC seems to have been dropped also from the from attachment B. And I was just wondering well, why we're doing that. Sure. Uh, excuse me, and I'll apologize if I get any of the singular exact things wrong. Uh, Director Matthews and I went through a spreadsheet the other day and had it down to the dollar. I forgot to bring that, but let me basically explain using your two examples. And might I reference also a bit of supporting information that relates to this. On item 10-5, there is a spreadsheet 10-5C.3. You don't particularly need to go to that, but that is a ongoing update and summary of the capital program. So every time there are changes, there are pluses and minuses. So that's kind of a reference point. But back to your direct question. Um, in this federal process where they give us an estimate before a year, hey, you're going to get about $450,000. We throw together a set of projects based on our unfunded capital list. We go through it and try to match up the most important things to it. Excuse me. Um, during the back and forth with the federal government on reviewing the projects we propose, we occasionally find out that a particular project is not eligible for this type of funding. And in this case, item two, the financial software, and item six, the business copy machine, just didn't happen to be eligible. It's kind of a common back and forth year in, year out. So those were taken off the list, and we approached funding those issues from other sources. On number seven, for example, the furniture, and number eight, the Paracruz MDCs, they were things that we needed relatively immediately, and we went ahead and funded them with other sources of money because they were sort of a right now thing. So when we are informed of the revised, updated, the result of the SBA Plus Up program, we then had a longer list and a, and a bunch of capacity available. So we went back to our unfunded capital list and built a larger list. And the most positive and interesting thing on the whole list, I'm assuming most people picked up on attachment B, was also there was 124,000 plus for bus stop improvements. That's through the efforts of our maintenance director and relationships with BTA, where they now were able to provide us about 60 shelters that we could add to our system, but we had a lot of refurbishing costs. So basically, between the few minuses and a few pluses, we grew the whole program by $146,000. Any other questions on this topic? Okay, I'll do a little over there. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries unanimously. Okay, um, item 13. Uh, consideration authorizing the CEO to extend the date of closure of this hotel parking ride lot. Mr. Cliff. Yes, Mr. Chair, directors, as you might recall, uh, late last year I brought an item to you to close the SoCal Park and Ride lot. Uh, effective end of the year, there was uh, considerable discussion at the board about that, and there were some folks in the audience who um, used that lot 
expressive. They use that a lot to ban cool to Moss Landing and to uh, Monterey. And so the board had great discussion about what to do. Uh, and and the, at the end of the discussion, opted to extend the uh, closure through March 31st and to have me ask the RTC if they would be willing to help, since they coordinate carpools and vanpools, if they would be willing to help uh, find a location for these folks to relocate to. Uh, so I did, in fact, do that, and the RTC took up the uh, challenge. Um, we did provide the RTC with all the information we had about knowledge of alternate locations in which park and ride uh, facilities were available, legitimate Caltrans park and ride. Keep in mind, SoCal Park and Ride is not a Caltrans park and ride. That is a lot that we, Metro, own. Um, so we, we pointed uh, the RTC to, that, uh, to those facilities. Then as uh, the end of March neared, um, uh, Guy, uh, contact, Guy Preston contacted me, um, Executive Director of RTC, and said, hey, you know, can we have a little bit more time? We're still working with these folks to try to find an alternate location. And so what I did is, since the timing wasn't right to get this to you in March, administratively I extended the, the deadline one month so that I could get this report to you uh, and ask you to concur for, with what I've already done and then to extend it an additional 30 days through the end of May. And then at that time, uh, we would go ahead and finish the closure of that park and ride lot. That concludes my presentation. Any questions of Mr. Matthews? Thank you. Um, I, have I have no problem extending the deadline and I'm glad RTC is finding um, alternate um, possibilities for its uh, carpooling lots. Um, but I do have a couple questions. One is, um, the whole issue of providing security for a lot that's no longer actively used. Um, I think there's always concern about just un unoccupied, unused, unsecured property. And um, that certainly will have some expense attached to it. Um, it's my understanding also that um, that lot has been used um, without authority or formal agreement by um, Dominican Hospital uh, employees. And uh, to my mind, it might be worth exploring uh, some kind of an arrangement for a uh, time-limited, short-term uh, agreement with Dominican, even if all they did was provide this, uh, make an arrangement, maybe it's a dollar a year, maybe some really nominal amount to let them use that parking uh, in return for providing security for it. Because I see the possibility for having um, unauthorized uses that we don't really want to have there. So I would just put that out as something to explore pretty actively. I like your reaction to that, but I do see the danger of just an empty lot sitting there without active security. Sure. Uh, to your first point, uh, you're absolutely correct, and, and as the board may recall, um, back late, late last year when I made that initial presentation, I had a number of pictures that I showed of illegal activity happening on the property uh, and how difficult that is for us to, to manage that particular facility. Uh, so certainly closing it down will eliminate that problem because we have a gate there already. We would just paddle off that, that gate. I will tell you that I spent uh, well over a year of my working career that I'll never get the hours back um, working with Dominican to try to figure out how to do a deal uh, on that property and it just failed and at the end of the day they park there, they continue to park there, why not keep parking there, why pay us because you know we don't have an enforcement arm. So we've tried that endeavor, I get your point, it has, it's nuanced in that maybe you do something uh, cheaper. Um, but if you recall, uh, and in exchange for security, but if you recall my um, presentation from late last year, it was we really want to get this lot closed and remove any dependence on the lot because we'd like to go through this process of giving it serious consideration for a future home for our para crews. We have searched high and low across this, the, this county, particularly the mid-county area, for a location to relocate para crews to. We lease facilities at a great cost. Um, 
they are horrible facilities. The manager, the leasing company doesn't take good care of it. And we're under threat that they will not renew the lease when it comes due in a couple of years. We must have a place to relocate Paracruz to or we're going to be in trouble. And so we've looked everywhere. Ciro has looked at anything from land in the Mid-County region that we could build on to other facilities that could accommodate us, and we just can't find anything. And the SoCal parking lot, uh, Park and Ride lot being Mid-County is a great location. You're going to have a discussion about that later. We're not even asking you to commit to that today, but we do need to, to preserve it until we get through that process. Just if I could continue that, I totally understand that, and I'm extremely supportive of the potential for that lot for the paratransit. That seems totally logical. Um, maybe give it one more shot. The Dominican tell them it's closing. <laughs> You're not going to have it. Um, that might be another incentive to um, assume some responsibility. Other than that, um, you know, I, I, I certainly uh, favor um, assuming control of it, but um, I, once again, am concerned with the uh, security, and certainly, even if it's got a gate across it, it is going to need some security. I think we know that. So, um, Let's give it one more shot for active use. And if that doesn't proceed, then budget for security. Any other que questions? Anybody from the public like to uh, talk on this topic? Bring it back for a discussion. Motion by Rockman. Second. Second by Lynn. I, I just want to make a comment. Uh, I. I, this item has come before us before, and uh, the first time I uh, was in favor of closing it immediately, this lot has become a nuisance for this organization. And uh, I, I do know that we have uh, future plans, and we, you know, it is a great location should we decide to utilize it for Paracruz. Um, I, I know that Mr. Clifford has made great attempts uh, to, to try to negotiate with Dominican, who's been unwilling. And I, and I feel that, uh, you know, I appreciate Director Matthews' uh, comments, but I think the best thing we do at this point is gain control of this lot, uh, allow uh, the, uh, the people that are there carpooling another 60 days. To, I, I believe the RTC does have alternatives for them. It isn't like there isn't an answer. Maybe not their, their primary choice. But I think we need to recapture this lot, uh, secure it, close the gate, and then following that, uh, the gate closure may lead to negotiations with uh, Dominican. I, I think trying to negotiate without closing it always puts them in the position to use it for free. So I'm thinking the move, uh, as suggested by the CEO, is to close it, recapture it, and deal with it then. But Director Lynn. Well, and I think a perfect case in point is our own metro lot in Scotts Valley. Mm -hmm. it, you know, years ago, neighbors began parking there, and then high-tech buses and when we reached a point of having difficulty, I know as a council member, I was getting letters from the homeowners, how dare you stop letting us park there. And it was never uh, for, in fact, in their, you know, when they bought their, CCNR said, you, you have this many park, this number of parking. But through the years, entitlement attitudes um, got them really upset at the city and Metro. So if, I think we need to be sure that we that it's clear that this is not a parking lot, and and the longer we take, the more difficult it is. Okay. I wonder if um, the maker of the motion would just accept um, the addition that uh, we plan realistically for security of the lot and remain open to future short-term arrangements. And a second. Yes. Everybody's friendly. With that, all in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay, item number 14 is uh, accept to report federal legislation and current legislative issues uh, during the Washington, D.C. visit. Uh, I'll, I'll preface this. Uh, I was fortunate to uh, attend with the CEO, uh, Director McPherson and Rodkin. We went back to Washington, D.C. for two days uh, to continue our effort to lobby for any kind of money we could find, any grants available to help us buy buses. And uh, I'm going to let uh, Director Rockton give a uh, detailed report of what we did back there. Thank you. I, I, will, I won't make it that detailed. I just have a couple of general points.
points to make. Um, <clears throat> first of all, when we go to D.C., we're basically lobbying for two things. Uh, more money in the transit system of the United States in general. So, like, we're trying to get the Congress to you know, end up appropriating more money for public transit and buses, particularly buses, because there's battles going on between rail and buses and uh, large districts and small and so forth. And the second part is for our own district to get money for grants. So we talked to both Congress uh, representatives, both the House and the Senate, but also to the administration because they're often the ones in charge of the doling out the various grants. So I want to start by just saying what the general points that we lobbied for so you understand. Um, we argued for an increase to bus and bus facilities. We want to um, basically increase it by $702 million nationally. Um, which would mean a fair amount of money back to us as one of the districts in the country. We also argued for an infrastructure package. That would help us with things like Pacific Station and a bunch of other kinds of issues going on. And we're there, we're arguing for a $7.42 billion infrastructure bill. This is the President Trump, when he first got elected, and promised he was going to focus on infrastructure. And we're trying to basically push that that actually happened in a real way that would affect public transportation. Um, we also are concerned because in 2020, the current authorization for fu any funding from the federal government for buses, um, capital money for any project, is, is, it, um, it, it runs out, it has to be renewed. In the past, um, the question is whether they're going to come up with a new bill. So usually they do these in five-year bills, not required, but that's the way it's worked historically, versus just extending the last one year by year. And you hope to get a new bill in that actually has more money in it and sort of looks to the future and had that happen. So we were trying to press them on the following question. Uh, you, you, this, it's, 2020 is not that far away. And the reality is in an election year, nobody's going to want to like you know, raise taxes, gas taxes, or something to try and pay for this package in some way. So we want them to act now, not you know, get the next. We have about a six month window here, honestly, before the election. You can know the election's already happening. But maybe for six months, people might be willing to do something. But after that, the advice we got from both Congress and the administration was, if you, uh, you know, wait for another six months and it doesn't happen then, it's probably not going to happen until after the election, because the reality is, you know, both sides, I mean, anything that one side agreed to, the other side would you know, disagree with, and both sides made that really clear. It was, it was a level of cynicism, I think, when we talked to people from, from the members of the Congress, or their, uh, their representatives, their, their staff, you know, that basically, you know, if, uh, if President Trump likes something, the Democrats would definitely like not let it happen, and vice versa. So there's both, I think in this case, it's dysfunctional on some level. And whereas it used to be a bipartisan issue, public transportation, it's not anymore in Washington, D.C. It's still more than almost anything else, but it's still not really bipartisan. And there's going to be this kind of uh, infighting going on about it. We also uh, lobbied that the uh, alternative fuel tax that we currently uh, receive uh, that, it, that it should be extended. We have a problem now in that we're already one year behind. They're supposed to give us the money um, you know, in a given year, and in fact, they don't get it done until the year following. So we're now just getting our money from the year before. And we'd like to have that made permanent, not just this kind of, it's a sort of a, uh, it's on a very shaky ground right now. So we, are, we lobbied that that should be made more permanent. Um, we also um, <coughs> um, argue that the uh, small transit intensive tier that we're part of, the stick program, that it's now, it's 2% of the bus and bus facility funding that goes to that. We'd like to have that raised to 3%. This district benefits from that because Santa Cruz meets six of the six criteria that are uh, available for getting the funding, which means we get quite a bit of money, and Watsonville meets five of those six criteria, so we get a lot of money out of that particular thing. We, we got a very favorable response from almost everybody we talked to. If, if the overall budget is funded, and most people thought that raising that to 3%, it's an incentive program. What it does, instead of just getting you know, bus money based on your population, it's based on how much service you provide. So we, we would be in a situation where because we provide a lot of public transit service in <coughs> a small community, we benefit from that as against a community that runs buses you know, nine to five, five days a week. Um, and there are many communities that do that, but we get more money than us because they have more population than we do. So, that's the kind of issues we were lobbying about. And then when we talked to the administration, we talked about our particular needs for buses. So I'm going to just say some general comments about the, the uh, lobbying effort that we're involved in. First of all, we had a really good team. Um, <coughs> we worked together in making these presentations. We, 
first of all, we have really good lobbyists in Washington, D.C. who set up these meetings. So in two days, we saw, I don't know, 15 different groups or individuals um, talking to them, at both in the administration and if they run, run across Washington, D.C., back and forth, but literally sometimes running and sometimes taking a, a bus, or, I mean, a, a, a cab, cab, cab or something to get there because it's too far to walk and may need an appointment that are almost back to back. Um, our team really worked well together, I think, in making a presentation about who we are as a district. And one of the things that happens on these lobbying trips is you put yourself on the radar of, of administration officials. They know that we exist, they know what our concerns are, and we're often a really good example of what transit needs are in this country because we're a relatively well-funded district for a small community given all the sales taxes that we go to locally and things like that. So if we're having problems, and we are having problems financially, Everybody in the country that's trying to run a bus system is having problems. So we had a good story to tell the people in Washington, D.C. And our team, I think, did a good job of making that presentation. Um, Alex was particularly good on the detailed facts. When you get into the question of administration, they want to know, well, you know, okay, we use this number, like somewhere between 50 and 60 buses have to be replaced. They want to know exactly how many buses, and they want to know when you need them and what's your strategy. And our strategy for laying out how we're going to move towards uh, uh, non-fossil fuel buses, you know, towards electric buses, we have to mesh, mesh that with the fact that we can't afford to simply buy electric buses starting tomorrow. We wouldn't have enough buses to run our service. So we've got a very complicated strategy <coughs> on how we're going to purchase buses and get federal uh, funding support for that. And I think we did a good job of explaining that to people and they seem to respond to it. I do want to say, uh, when we, I get, told a story, I think it was uh, last year or the year before, about the Trump administration when we went there, it was totally dysfunctional. They didn't have any you know, appointees that had not been filled in, and the people, the whole transit industry seemed to be run by some guy who had been in President Trump's campaign in New Hampshire and knew nothing about public transit. This time, I guess you might put it this way to be funny about it, but I think the Trump administration is slowly being captured by what somebody might call the deep, the deep state or something, because they're beginning to actually do their jobs and trying to figure out in the, in the FTA, Federal Transit Administration, you know, how do you actually get the money out there? How do you, when Congress is authorized funding, how do you actually get it out there where the people can benefit from it? And, and that was not the experience that we had two years ago and last year. This year, they seem to be starting to actually do the job like any normal administration would, of taking the money they've been given and actually sending it out so it can be put to use for the public. Um, and I, that was sort of noticeable. People were still uh, a little cynical and still uh, pessimistic about the, uh, the likelihood that we're going to get a renewal of the public transit funding, um, but they were not depressed like they were last year. I mean, the, the, the Democratic representatives in the House at least feel like they're doing something now, whereas before it was like, oh, what can we do? It's like this, it's hopeless. So I, I felt like there was a little more optimism that we could actually get some funding. We got a very good response from the administration about our particular uh, grants. They reassured us that we, they are not going to take back the money for the over-the-hill buses that didn't work that we tried to, that we uh, tested out that didn't work for us, they have the right to just take the money back. And they <coughs> made it clear they're going to give us more time to get an electric bus that actually will go over the hill and come back and with, with, with a charge and not be stuck somewhere in the middle of the summit or something without, without an adequate uh, ability to move. And pretty much, we also met with the AFTA, the American Public Transit Association. It's a group we pay to help lobby for us for transit. Um, it's a small amount, actually, but they, they, uh, we met with them, and, and again, with them, we're trying to lobby about the importance of funding small districts like us and having making sure that the lobby message they send to Congress is not just the benefit of big cities or rail service, things like that. So I think this was a very uh, effective trip. I think it makes a difference for us to go there. I think these people know who Santa Cruz, in, in Washington, D.C., they know about Santa Cruz, which is not insignificant. And as many of you may know, we were the ones that actually started that intensive tier out of Santa Cruz and got others to join us in the process. So for a small district, we make a difference in D.C., and I think that's worth saying, make, make, making note of. So I appreciated the, the team I worked with. I think we did a good job, and I think we did a good job of representing this transit district and our, and our passengers and our, and our employees. Director McPherson, do I have anything? Yeah, I think you said about just um, the, uh, you know, the, it, the importance of doing this consistently was uh, very clear too. They say you guys care, and we've been successful. And uh, I guess to put it another way, uh, we have been very successful. If we have, if we had not been consistent in going back there and giving them our consistent message of what our needs are, 
uh, our chances of getting anything are zero. I mean, if not zero, we're certainly close to it. Uh, so it's, it's absolutely essential. It's uh, two very busy days running, running from one place to another, as uh, Director Rock had said uh, very, very uh, capably about the differences of what we need, the capital needs, the operational needs. Um, they know Santa Cruz Metro is on, on it, and we have identified our needs very clearly. Believe me, it's, it's uh, thin pickings from this administration. Now it seems to be uh, loosening up a little for public transit, as Director Lockrockton said. But uh, I, I'm, I'm not overconfident, but I, I, I think we have as good a chance as anybody of any district our size to, to get some of it, to fill, have them help fill the needs that we, uh, we have upon us. So uh, I appreciate the team and the effort we've done. I think it's been a very effective uh, journey uh, after the board visit to uh, Washington, D.C. Oh, well said. Okay, that's just an oral report. Uh, take us to our next item, which is item 15, which is a 10-year fiscal 20 to 29 strategic business plan update. Barrow. Uh, good morning, Chair, board members, staff, and public. Again, I'll try to keep this relatively succinct. Um, long-range bus replacement plan. Staff request that the board receive this update on the progress on this program. As background, at the start of FY18, as uh, Mr. Clifford and I had drummed into everybody's head, 62 of our 103 buses were beyond their useful life. And the most important thing about this is it resulted in a lack of reliability of vehicles and significant extra maintenance costs, and this is really important. It gets lost in the minutia. But if, you, if you've ever owned an old car like I do, you waste a lot of money taking care of old vehicles, but I digress. Through a number of strategies, Mer Metro will have reduced this number of 62 obsolete buses excuse, down. Excuse there. me, girl. Are you on item 15 or 16? I apologize. Yeah. I, I jumped. I <laughs> apologize. <laughs> You're up here three times in a row. I'm, I'm kind of sick, so I'm I just, understand. I apologize. Let me start. Dr. Quickly. Matthews caught you. All right, so <laughs> thank you. Sorry. Um, the Capital Committee at their 419 meeting has forwarded to the board the staff recommendation for approval of Metro's initial strategic plan, the previous version of which was approved by the board on January 25th, pending some modifications to wordings of, of the some of the key strategic initiatives, including couple requested by Director Leopold and Matthews. If you'll see attachment B, the red line version, that includes their recommended changes along with some administrative one the staff continue to improve. Subsequent to that board approval, Metro has added a five-year implementation plan for all of these initiatives, which is attachment C. The strategic plan priorities, the seven priorities you established at your work session last October, and these key tactical initiatives that the management team built off of those seven priorities, these all together provide priorities for the use of Metro's limited financial and staff resources. In support of this focus, it is recommended that in the future all staff reports include a strategic plan elements section. This has become pretty common in public agencies. The five-year implementation plan, attachment C, is not a commitment of funding, but rather an identification of future funding needed to advance these various initiatives, including, <coughs> and what was the source of these estimates? As you know, we always maintain a 10-year unfunded capital list, which is attachment D, so we pulled things in the next five years off of that list, as well as our service expansion priorities, as are identified in attachment E, which was part of my annual report to the board last August on our future service improvement priorities if we're ever allowed funding. Excuse me. So I think that speaks enough to that topic, so this was here for your approval. Any questions? Anyone from the public like to weigh in on the 10-year strategic plan? Seeing none, I'll give that for comment. I just want to say I'm, I'm quite impressed by the uh, job that our staff did in, in taking 
we had a retreat where this sort of started thinking about what are our priorities. We start with safety was the first thing we came to, but others and often they're competing and you, you don't want to live, if you, if you have a million priorities, you have no priorities. So you gotta really boil it down and decide what do you really care about. And it was, I think, a difficult decision, but I think the board worked well on that. Then the uh, management went out to the various employees in the, of the district and asked them for feedback about this. So it's been a process that's tried to engage the entire agency in, in deciding what these priorities are and how they're gonna work. And I think they've done a really good job of actually operationalizing some vague general goals and turning them into something you could actually know what it is we want to do, what we want to fund to make it really happen. So I, I'll move that we approve this, uh, the, uh, the uh, recommendation of staff here. Motion by Roger. Second. Second by McPherson. I have a comment from the CEO. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just want to acknowledge that uh, this this is our first strategic plan. Um, thank you, Barrow, to guiding us through this. Barrow had experience in the same thing at Samtrans, so we tap that experience. Uh, I think we would all agree it's probably not perfect. It's our first stab at it, and as you know, we will bring this back on an annual basis, minimally on an annual basis, to update it and revise it. And then once our marketing director comes aboard, we'll see if that person can take this and package it into a, a nice looking document. That's a great plan. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, I just want to, this is a, absolutely essential that we do this to give the public an idea of what, what our top priorities are. Uh, we, we've done this in the county for the first time as well, in Santa Cruz County government. Uh, it's, a, it's a tool that we really need, and, and if we hear that people want changes or a difference in priorities, we're open to it. But uh, I think this has been a great process that uh, has let the board really get a focus on and, and with input from the community. I'm, I'm really glad we have this. I think it's going to really uh, point us in the right direction, the direction that the, the people want to go. Matthews. Yes, I've been over this. <laughs> so now, the more you go over it, the more you see. Um, so just a couple of questions. Um, uh, it's a really impressive document. Um, and obviously what we're shooting for is um, good repair and maintaining service. Um, I do have a question. We brought this up in um, some of our discussions. Is it worth stating um, in, in terms of service planning that the priority is um, improving frequency of service rather than coverage? It's, um, it's implied in a lot of our discussions. Um, whether, pardon? Um, Are you looking someplace specifically? Or directly uh, there's a reference, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to find it in my notes here, to um, identifying the Route 35, Route 68, um, and Watsonville circulator as priorities, but but again, simply stated, oh, it's 15.3. If, if I can direct you maybe on page 15C2 to 3A, I think we try to capture that, uh, that idea. Yeah, and I, here's, I see on 15B3, um, it's, G at the very top, um, in response to countywide decisions, et cetera, develop plans along the following corridors. So um, perhaps just insert, I'm, I'm asking the question, in, inserting there that the priority is um, continuing to be frequency of service <coughs> on, on the uh, strongest transit corridors. Actually, if I, uh, I apologize, if I could direct you, I mean, just I'm trying to catch up, page B2, 3B. So, yeah, I, I guess that, uh, that does, um, yeah. Increase the resources committed yeah. to ridership generating versus coverage oriented. Yeah, I think that captures it. Yeah, thank you. And I appreciate that because that was the theme that Chair Walker helped us That's bring. That's what we kept hearing. Yeah. And as a very quick primer, I would, in the same breath as frequency, always say span of service. And that it, is, yeah. is there. Yeah. Right. Span of frequency until 5 p.m. does you no good if the bus stops at 5 right. p.m. So we have to find that balance between span of the day and frequency. So thank you very much for highlighting that. Um, on that first page, 5B1, and you talk about um, reinvesting in bricks. Bricks of the company. <laughs> with quotes around it, what, what are we thinking about for that? Um, 
that, uh, sorry for using a bit of a cliche there, but you might remember a... Uh, a I remember the graphic. With graphic. The and, and bricks of a company is just a cliche trying to summarize. We feel uh, the man, and I think there was some wording in another part here, where, where the management team feels that uh, there's a need for a bit of time of consolidation of so many features of Metro before we grow. If we grow, and I might defer to uh, uh, Mr. Clifford on this, but you can't outstep your capacity to do what you do. So getting our vehicles better, getting our staffing right, getting our technology caught up before we run forward. It's a tough balance. So I took that to mean capital improvements, operations, technology. Maybe we could just put those words in here. Sure. Bricks is a little big. Sure, I appreciate that. Um, when we talk about um, the right below that, the fair restructuring um, and talks about a potential increase. And I know we've had this discussion previously. There is always the um, trade-off between increase, at least that's my understanding, and decreased ridership. And um, I would assume that there would be a, a pretty thorough study of those that trade-off before we... Oh, absolutely. <laughs> if, you'll, if you'll remember, we started down this path a year or so ago and we took a time out due to SB1 Prop 6, but we had pointed out in our initial briefings that in, like any business model, price goes up, purchase goes down. And you just you look at where those X, Y, I axes cross and that will be the hard decisions for us when we get to that point price goes up 25 cents, you lose some number of riders. Is that the right or wrong mm -hmm. thing to do? Great. Um, I don't want to monopolize here. No, okay, go I, ahead. I got a few. <laughs> right now it's on you, go ahead. Um, let's see. Yes. As you go on, if you're thinking of actually amending this in some way, would you, as you finish each point, maybe suggest you know, when, when, when you're just trying to bring something to our attention I think those two, I, I would, versus, versus I think actually, you got the redefining of bricks. And, yeah. And I was going to ask if the motion, and, was, when she was done, I was going to say, but I bear you taking the notes. Right, and I will, of course, check back informally to see that I got it, because I, I, we really appreciate you all being interested in this. This is vital I've only, got, I've only got two minor changes so far. So yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and some of them are just clarifications, sure. so don't need to change anything. Um, Let's see. Um, I'm, I'm going to jump to 5B5, I think. Um, 15, 15B5, excuse me. Um, oh, 15B4. And we talked the state of good repair, the first one. We talked about the 62 buses. And I think that number is now 53. Is that right? It's 53. And um, I think. As this thing evolves over time, let's use the number that's real. I think that's important for honesty to the public. So, good for us. 53 <laughs> is, is the number. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Um, so, on 15B5, and there's um, the discussion of Pacific Station, um, there's some confusion in my mind about the amount of money <clears throat> available. This mentions two million, and then we talk uh, later on about designating a million years, a certain number of years. Um, there's also, as I understand it, some earmarks. So I would personally like um, greater clarity on what is the funding available um, for the Pacific Station. And um, also, I think there's the sentence um, in B on page 15, B5, that section B. Um, subject to the results of studies currently underway, the current condition of the structure may require Metro to invest more than two million in the near future toward rehab or a new facility. That should be will. <laughs> I mean, we know it's gonna cost more than two million to do anything there. Um, well, it still may still accurately define it. I apologize, this document was produced for January. I know it's older before we right. did those studies. So I will I will bring everything up to date and in line. Yeah. 
maybe that's the direction to give to bring that section up to what we now know. If we can leave it that general. And I would also um, suggest that we uh, add a statement that um, a resolution of Pacific Station um, should be the highest priority for facility improvements since it is the largest passenger serving facility. Mr. Chair, can I suggest that we bring this back to committee one more time? It's not. I, I, th I think this would be well advised to bring it back to committee. I don't think we need to be working. You mean thinking. this this section? Well, the, if there's changes to the document, I would rather see it done as a, at the committee level and then brought back to us okay. as a final document. Uh, you know, I'm fine with that, and I apologize because we did go through it, but right. yeah. it's not time constraint. So it, it's perfect. Yeah. All right, that's great. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I'll change my motion. That's kind of my, uh, the gist of my comments. I do have some others, so with that, I'll look forward Director to Director has withdrawn his motion, and the second has yes. been withdrawn. And so I, I'll make the motion that we uh, redirect this to the committee for further work, but still uh, appreciating the work that the staff has done to get it to this point. Absolutely. And is there a second on that? Yes, yeah. I'll second by uh, I, I really want to appreciate the staff's work and the necessity for this and the fact that they're it's a bit of a moving target right now. So, um, so we'll, we'll, that, we'll, that's the, um, <laughs> the tone in which my comments I, I think are. that's the appropriate action <laughs> to take at this point. And I think uh, uh, especially in light of the addition of this and recent estimates yeah. that have been received and that right. we didn't have until the last, this right. last month. They were just pointing out this was January, so yeah. uh, we, we knew this is a good that. change. And I think we all appreciate this as a living document. and, and yeah. For my sake, I'm just going to have trouble getting out of my head that if you have a thousand priorities, you have no priorities. So I'm with me for the rest of the day. Absolutely. So um, we'll take a motion on this. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carries, and uh, that's a good decision there. All right, Barrow, now we can move to item 16 and uh, rewind the, the video and start with bus replacement plan. Would you like to repeat the No, 62 is now 53. Thank you. All right. So, but the important thing about getting from 62 to 53 is by the start of the next f fiscal year, only a few months from now, we're gonna have that number down to 34. So Metro, all parts of Metro have m made amazing contributions to that solution. I won't go into those details. The most important strategy that has allowed us to achieve this in reducing this number has been the board approval two years ago of a commitment of $3 million annually in our capital funding to a bus replacement fund which allows Metro to refurbish and rehabilitate older buses, lease by and or buy new buses, and most importantly, and to provide funding for local matches to support grant applications for replacement buses, as it was referred to earlier by Director Rotkin. New funding from Major D and SB1 created the revenue which allowed Metro to even create this bus replacement fund. You'll note in attachment A that this plan reduces the number of obsolete buses to zero in the year 2024, before that number unfortunately climbs back into the 30s in subsequent years, as there are currently lots of buses that are the appropriate age, but they're moving towards that 14-year mark themselves. And over the next four years, that problem reoccurs. Again, relative to local match, and I can't emphasize this enough, on attachment A, Page 16A3, first of all, reminder of the attachment. We start with a pretty bar chart, which everybody can appreciate. Look at that, we got to zero and then it goes back up. We all get that. The next page is the details. It looks like a baseball uh, scorecard, every inning, top of the inning, bottom of the inning. And it is matched in page three of that attachment of how we do that financially. And the most important thing I want to take your attention to is the last row at the bottom with the light blue numbers. The whole intent here is to have enough money every year to go after grants and locally match them. And the competition around the country doesn't mean you offer 10% matches anymore. You'll be laughed and your thing will be rejected. You gotta match 50 and 100%. We did it two years ago, we got four buses. We asked for nine, we said we'd match them 100%. They gave us four, we matched them 100%. That's how tough a game it is. So, back to my point. Uh, if Metro is not successful with a grant application, these fund, let's say one year we take the 2.5 million we've got and we put it up and we don't win, we roll it in the next year and we say, okay, we're going to ask for more buses or a higher match percentage. 
we understand that if you don't win it for a couple of years, you may have to go out and buy a couple or four or five buses cash because we've got to chase this obsolescence issue. So this plan takes into account the requirement by CARB to start purchasing zero emission buses in 2026. You'll notice our assumptions about the price of buses moving from 700,000 to a million at that point. It's important to know from the federal government to the local, because if you keep the bus for two years longer, you're going to have more maintenance costs. And so that was a pretty cynical move on their part. It's not like buses are now lasting two years longer than they used to. They, just, they don't want to pay the funding, so we end up paying it. I think that's really unfortunate. And um, I do think that, just as a way of comment, I think that the strategy we have of replacing our buses is the correct way to go. I think we have a good plan here for addressing maybe our biggest single issue, which is the lack of an adequate number of buses to provide our service. Thank you. Okay, I'll take us to item 17, update and action relative to Pacific Station. Barrow. I will defer to Mr. We'll defer to Mr. Clifford following our item at the Capitol Committee a couple of weeks ago. Great. Uh, Mr. Chair, directors, as you know, uh, and as you read in the report, this has uh, been a, an interesting, interesting and long process to, to try to figure out what the future of uh, Pacific Station is, actually going back in excess of 10 years, predating me by many years. Uh, and when I first came aboard, there was a, a uh, process going on with a company called Group 4, to look at a transit-oriented development that might have uh, in its vision a bus tarmac on a lower level of a, of a, uh, and a structure up to, say, seven stories above it that would be a combination of retail and, and office and housing and parking structure. And at the conclusion of that process, that became uh, way too cost prohibitive. There was no way for Metro to even envision coming up with their, their share of that particular um, uh, project. So then, uh, as, as you're familiar, we continued in partnership with the city to discuss this, and in committees, you've had many, many committee meetings on this particular topic, um, trying to figure out how to move forward. And then, in more recent times, we've become a little bit time constrained because um, the city has a fairly major redevelopment project we think will occur um, from sort of our boundary or property line all the way to Laurel. So uh, if something's going to happen, the time might be right for that to happen in the way of some sort of joint use, joint development type of concept. Um, the committee will recall, and, and uh, I'll, I'll mention it just so the board understands, that there came a point recently when I said, hey, time out, we need to get some data. Um, because if we're going to talk to the city, if we're going to investigate uh, some sort of rebuilding, redevelopment type concept, we really need to know what we have there and what the uh, cost would be to, to take care of the existing facility. Uh, as you're well aware, that facility leaks badly. We've had to spend a lot of money on it. You've dedicated additional money to it that we haven't spent yet because we're continuing to patch that facility. Um, but all of that told us uh, not too long ago that we better look at this and figure out what's wrong with that facility and how much it excuse me, how much will it cost to fix it? <clears throat> so the, the board and the committee indulged me, allowed me to um, put out a contract uh, to have it thoroughly evaluated from head to toe, the existing facility. Uh, that took time. It took time for us to get it back to the committee. Uh, the result of that uh, deep dive into the facility revealed that if we want to rehabilitate it in kind, that is, sort of tear everything down to the studs, um, repair what needs to be repaired, bring electrical plumbing up to code, replace the uh, badly leaking windows, replace the roof. That's a $5.6 million proposition. And if we want to tear it down completely and rebuild it basically on existing foundation and footings, not, not uh, reorienting anything at this particular point, but just tearing it down to the ground and rebuilding it, that, that study revealed that's about a $12.5 million uh, cost. Uh, so based on that, uh, we took all of that information to the committee, and it, it, I think this would be the appropriate time to turn over the rest of the presentation to the committee chair, uh, Mr. Bontor. Great. Um, I'll go ahead and start off on this. It came to the Capital Committee, and uh, it became apparent that uh, that uh, the, the damage was far more than we had anticipated and, and brought in the conversation 
that are moving towards the possibility of a, of a new Pacific station, especially in light of an arrangement with the city of Santa Cruz being motivated to deliver a project. And what I believe is a uh, fundamental belief by our new governor that uh, uh, tying together housing and transportation is something that might be successful with uh, capturing some additional funds and also some input from AMBAG was there with some other programs. Uh, I can't remember the acronym for now for, the, for that fund, but uh, it, it seemed like the timing was really good that we might be successful and my, our priority, we might be prioritized uh, in that effort. So um, with that, uh, the, the uh, Capital Committee made the recommendation that um, we'd like to direct uh, the CEO to in, engage in uh, uh, conversation with the city of Santa Cruz and seriously negotiate to uh, build a new Pacific station. So I'll let the other committee members weigh in. Yeah, I, just, uh, I was just up in Sacramento earlier this week and listened to the governor and some of his presentations. And one of the things he is focused on very highly is, is housing and homelessness and so forth. And initially he had uh, mentioned that uh, if nobody in the state, to begin with, is meeting their housing needs, uh, according to the, uh, the state, the state included, they want to build 180 to 200 units a year, and they're only building about 80,000 a year. I said 80 to 100, I mean thousands. Uh, and so uh, initially they, there, was a pre, uh, there was a suggestion that if you don't meet your uh, local housing needs, as we say that you should uh, from the state, we might take away some of your transportation funding. Well, that blew up in everybody's face, and the governor has since, uh, and his, the administration has since rethought that. That is the right way to go. He does want to target some communities who are not living up, or are far, far, far short, uh, and don't even want to get engaged in the housing issue and their general long-range general plans. Um, so it is encouraging to me that uh, it appears the uh, the administration is not going to punish transportation if you don't meet, meet your housing needs in this, uh, your community or throughout the state of California. So I think it's an important point to make. Uh, it was a scary proposal to, uh, 60 days ago. Dr. Matthews, like to wait? Um, yes, I, uh, some members of the committee are aware, but I just want to uh, make, uh, make the point for the, the public and others present here that in addition to the city, there are some superb um, potential partners for this. Uh, Santa Cruz Community Health Centers and Dante's Community Health Clinic are very interested in coming in at that location. These are two highly credible, proven local organizations and they are very excited. They too have, have told us that there's funding uh, in their world, <laughs> in the healthcare uh, world, for projects that are co-located or very close to transit and close to affordable housing. So. Uh, the feeling in the committee, and it has been in the city, that there, the stars may be lining up in terms of fiscal resources to uh, uh, actually achieve an ambitious and uh, amazing project that improves the um, metro, metro base, that provides affordable and workforce housing, that improves the entire stretch downtown, and yet provides the circulation, um, the, the um, Metro and City uh, uh, co-funded a, a project that confirmed that. So I, I wanted to add that as, as part of why this looks particularly promising right now. It was unanimous Any questions of, of the other commissioners? Yes. I, uh, just a couple of questions, and I think I think we we have already addressed this, but um, one thing would just to be um, to make sure we have sort of the financials in terms of grants and sources and future revenues needed, so we maybe build out a pro forma or something so we sort of get that full picture. Um, I think that would be important just for the public to understand um, both the opportunity and the, uh, the, uh, the mechanisms that we will use to bring hopefully this project to fruition, so that's a lot of state funding as well as different sources. So just to sort of update a little bit on the numbers on that, I just want to um, thank the Capital Committee for moving this forward. It's very exciting. Um, and as a council member, um, I just would like to reiterate that housing is one of our number one, it is our number one uh, uh, goal in our strategic plan for the city of Santa Cruz. We are greatly in need of affordable housing for our community. and. Uh, 
I know I speak um, just for, as one council member, but I think that is one place we're all united. And uh, this certainly is an amazing opportunity for us. So I think we will very much look forward to working with Metro on this and bringing the project. It's a priority for the county, the entire county. <laughs> Any other uh, questions? I'll go ahead and open it for the public. Any? Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, a brand new um, facility on Pacific Avenue would certainly be in the interest of the students of UCS. Um, I've heard uh, many desires for a cleaner, safer, uh, newer facility um, that students can use, uh, especially if housing is included. This would also uh, directly address um, many of the concerns of UCSC students. Um, a personal concern that, that I have is that um, if we were to, as you said, tear it down to the studs, um, what would service look like during that time? Um, obviously, we can't be running buses at the same volume through a facility that's in the middle of a what seems like a massive renovation. Um, so I just want to make sure that moving forward with this, that, that we ensure that um, the many, many, many students that rely on the station, as well as community members, um, will still be able to experience the uh, bus frequency that they expect. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, bus service would absolutely be different, and for a synopsis of that, I'll let the CEO expand on that. Yeah, I think it's an excellent question, and it's part of uh, what we, irrespective of whether we tear down to the studs or we completely tear it down and reconfigure it and build something new, um, along the journey, we have to figure out how we keep bus operations going. And there are no large lots anywhere nearby the downtown that we can just say, oh, we'll just relocate over there and make things happen. So that that it's an excellent question. We don't have an answer. It is part of what we have to yet figure out. Uh, and, and Mr. Chair, if I can just go one step further. Absolutely. Um, because we have so many of our bus operators in the audience today, um, and, and they've always had an interest in this topic, and they've always been well represented uh, in discussions. Um, Metro has always approached this from the perspective of making sure that uh, not only in whatever we do, we replace what we have, but we take into consideration future growth. And that we always remember that um, our bus operators need a place to take a break, and we need to have restroom facilities available, and those kinds of things are important, just as they are today, they will be in whatever we do in the future. And part of what I didn't talk about is in between that group four study and, and this new idea that we have, um, we went through an exercise that Barrow and the city worked on to get a couple of studies to see if reconfiguring a tarmac would even work here. There was some uh, expressed ideas that maybe we should just disperse. No, we don't need a, a transit hub. We should just disperse our operations throughout the downtown. Um, it was a good question. It was worthy of answering. We went through a study and it said, um, bus hub works. There, there was some notion that does everything need to come into the downtown, period, right? Um, and so the study revealed that based on the way our operations work and the nature of our county, that this was the best way to operate bus service in Santa Cruz County. So it reinforced that the hub was the right way to go. Then we had to turn to the tarmac, how many spaces, and we wanted to make sure minimally we had what we need. And I think Barrow, it's 25 is the number that we, we have. And so sort of at a 30,000, 20,000 foot level, we designed something that could facilitate uh, commercial, retail, industrial housing along Pacific Avenue and a 25 bay tarmac and, and associated facilities on the backside on front. Uh, but that now needs to be taken down to the 1,000 foot level. We've got to figure out when you start tweaking property lines and allocating the right amount for the commercial retail, can it, can it be done? And that's part of this next step too. So there's a lot of work to be done, but at least at a 30, 50,000 level, I'm very optimistic, I think, as the team is. Thank you for the question and the explanation. I think everybody needed to hear that. I was curious if we have an estimate in terms of how long this disruption would likely take if we do tear it down and rebuild. I think we'll figure that out. I, I will always throw out two years as likely the time frame from the moment we turn the first shovel till we're cutting a ribbon. It's extensive. Just one other follow-up question. Um, I'm 
page uh, 17.6, there's some discussion around some of the funding. And uh, I just reached out to our staff just in terms of knowing uh, how we're going to put all this, this together. It's complicated with many grant sources. And I did get clarification. There's a statement that uh, regarding the um, PTMISEA funds, um, those not being able to be assigned to the city. And I believe that, um, I believe we would want to remedy that. I'm not sure that our staff is completely uh, in alignment with that statement. So I'd like, I'd, I'd just like to request that some of, some of these details obviously get worked out as we, as we move forward and uh, work on the project. Uh, you can kind of see where those resources are going. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm going to open up to the public and or the city if anybody wants to make a comment on this topic. Hi again, uh, my name is Elise Casby, and I'm really happy to be able to comment on this, and I'm glad I was here to, uh, to be able to hear what's being said about the Pacific Station in the future. Um, I just want to highlight a couple of things at a discussion I was at the other night at the Resource Center for Nonviolence. A uh, well-informed person in the community used to teach at Cabrillo College, Dennis Sattler, was saying that in Santa Cruz, uh, something like 60 to 80 percent of the people here are working class people, people whose lives are, are very much um, being impacted by the increasing gentrification of Santa Cruz, which is just kind of a normal thing, I think, that's happening because of Silicon Valley being over the hill and uh, land values, what they are, and rising costs of housing. I just want to emphasize that although affordable housing is valuable, um, that we need inclusionary housing in these development plans. Uh, we have this measure O that requires a certain amount of inclusional, inclusional, inclusionary housing in our developments, and that's continually being uh, lessened and lessened, and it seems to be part of a complicated funding uh, kind of configuration of where the money's gonna come from, but I think at some point we need our government bodies to really protect the working people who have lived here for a long time, people who are also poor who are hanging on here, and there's nobody else that's gonna be really able to do this, this for us. So I would say affordable housing is great. Low-income housing, or even very low-income housing, needs to be really factored in. The other thing that I want to just ask the board to please help us with is, if we consider our bus hub, and I'm not sure if the hub is the Pacific Station, when you refer to a hub, are you referring to the Pacific Station, but I would like for the board to please consider that this is a public commons, um, and there are some really amazing things being done here on the West Coast in terms of public commons that include environmental design and landscape architecture, beautiful inclusionary spaces that are quite active in Portland, and the name of the landscape architect there is Mark Lakeman. I would love it, and I would really urge you to look at his presentations. He's doing some very important public works uh, design in San Francisco. He's, his father was also in urban design, and he is um, just amazing for what he can bring together. So I'm hoping that you will look. And last, would you please include the public as much as possible, not in what is usually done, decisions already made to promote them and sell them to the public, but please, along the way, would you please present to the public and get input. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Chair and uh, Directors. Uh, my name is Bonnie Lipscomb. I'm Director of Economic Development for the City of Santa Cruz. And I'm really excited to briefly um, speak today and just um, to appreciate the comments um, made during the staff report and by Mr. Clifford. We're really excited to partner with Metro on this project. We hope um, we're able to move forward. As Mr. Clifford mentioned, this project has been a long time um, in the planning analysis. and we at that point um, um, where it is a critical timing 
We are moving forward in the downtown. We've assembled some adjacent parcels. We um, have at a time when the downtown has been approved for over 700 units of housing in the downtown. This project um, has the potential to bring over 100 units of affordable housing in the downtown. Um, we've lined up some various funding sources. We believe we um, are in a good position to apply for the uh, affordable, community, affordable Housing Sustainable Communities Grant coming up with round five. And um, want to acknowledge uh, Chair Bontor for setting up um, a meeting for us with Heather Edmondson from AMBAG that was really helpful from a timing perspective of moving forward. So we feel like the timing is right. Um, in addition to um, the housing that will be in downtown, that's going to dramatically increase, I believe, the ridership for Metro. Um, so we're at the point where we really feel like we need to invest overall in our downtown for the long-term sustainability of our downtown, and that includes also uh, the riders of Metro in the downtown. We believe a new facility with pedestrian enhancements will really help um, downtown, will help and improve the ridership. Um, in addition to that, um, as uh, Director Matthews mentioned, we have a partnership that we've been um, working with with the Santa Cruz Community Health Center and Dentist to provide low-cost, comprehensive dental care and health care uh, for individuals and children in our community, not just Santa Cruz, the whole Santa Cruz County. So we're really excited by our partners that we have in this project and just feel like this is a great project for our community and we hope you support it. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Anyone else from the public? I'll bring it back for discussion and motion. Rep. Rockner. I won't. I'll, there are other comments. I'll be happy to bring them, but I'll, there are other comments. I'll be happy to refer to them, but I'm prepared to move and will now move that we direct our uh, CEO Alex Clifford to negotiate with the city over the whole issue of how this will get developed and to appreciate the report. Uh, motion by Rockton, second by McPherson. Any other comments? <coughs> okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries unanimously, and I wish the CEO of the City of Santa Cruz the best of luck. Carry on. Okay, um, next item is uh, item 18 consideration of contract for land use and development services of Swift Consulting. Daniel, welcome. Good morning, directors. Daniel Zaragoza, um, Operations Manager of Santa Cruz. So this morning I'm here to request approval from the Board of Directors on the concept of potentially relocating the Paracruz Operations Facility to a new facility at the Soquel Park and Ride on Paul Sweet Road. Currently this um, park and ride is underutilized and it, it is owned by Metro and it could be potentially the future home of Paracruz. Um, currently, our facility on um, Research Park Drive is costing the district approximately $200,000 a year. It has uh, more office space than what we need, and this is due to um, the merger from the Paracruz uh, Reservation is with the Customer Service um, Department. And we don't have enough parking for our fleet at the current facility. Um, so um, when we renewed the, this current lease, it was hinted by the owner of the property that he might not renew uh, the lease when this lease expires in 2021. So at the April 19th Capital Project Standing Committee meeting, the committee approved the proposed contract for land use and development service consulting services with Swift Consulting Services for a potential Paracruz operations facility at the Soquel Park and Ride. The services of the land use development consultant will be used to determine if the project for the potential Paracruz administrative office and vehicle parking is feasible for the process and risks associated with permitting and to assist the develop development of a rough order of magnitude cost estimate by analyzing construction op options such as stick built, portables, and modular buildings. 
Should we proceed with a consultant contract, the initial cost shouldn't exceed $10,000. And it would be paid out of the fiscal year 19 administrative, administrative operating budget. The cost is within the CEO's authority. At this time, staff is requesting approval from the Board of Directors on the concept of potentially relocating the Paracruz operations facility to a new facility at the Sotel Park and Ride and to proceed with preliminary analysis. Thank you. Uh, this, uh, this again was an item that came to the Capital Committee and it, this, this is an exciting proposal. We, we, I have been to the facility uh, Paracruz is, is housed in now. It's, a, it's an inverse facility. It means that uh, there's not enough room for the parking and, and they need, they, they have no use for three quarters of the building that they occupy for office space. So the one good thing that this uh, suite property operates, offers for us is that there's a, a complete abundance of ability to park our existing fleet and any expanding fleet. And um, this is to, I guess, consider the options as was mentioned for uh, what kind of buildings would, would be the uh, most appropriate site, but this would be uh, a great location for Paracruz to operate because of its mid-county location, and uh, I think that uh, we owe it to our this, this organization to at least look at what's, what's potentially out there and what we could possibly do. Any questions for Dan or Director Rushman? Um, I appreciate um, why this is not going out the bid. It's under $10,000. We'll save a lot of money by not going through a formal bid process for consultants. Could you tell us something about who Swift Consulting is and who's, who's, who, who are these people and what are they going to do for us? I cannot, but I think Aaron can. can. <laughs> uh, so we have uh, been working with Weber Hayes and Associates, Pat Hoven, for probably about 20 years on our Pacific Station project. And um, we started talking to Pat about this project, and he recommended Swift. They're a local land use development company. Um, that can that, that knows the county very well, and they'll be able to walk us through the beginning uh, phases here. So it, it actually was a, a recommendation from from Pat. So is this is this Jonathan Swift? Yeah, and yeah. Get, get Hamilton. Well, John done a lot of work for them. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, yeah. In, they're independent now, but independent. Yeah. yeah, but it's Jonathan Swift's company. Mm -hmm. Metro hasn't used them yet, but like I said, and the city has a lot of experience yeah. working with them. Yeah. They've done great work for us in, in the past. So. Great. Absolutely. Just comments. Yeah, I'm totally supportive of this. Um, uh, just a couple questions. So, um, will this contract? I uh, understand it explores the uh, permitting process, and it talks about a rough order of magnitude cost for a new facility, um, both construction options. Does it also include the the cost of bringing it to a fully functional? Um, state, which would include bringing in any utilities that might be necessary, maybe resurfacing the lot. Um, and that's what, and I, I realize it's all it's a little, really rough order of magnitude. But. Sure, it's a little early for that. You know, we're going to try to get as, as much cost estimating done as possible. But really the early stages are going to be um, biological investigation, archeological <coughs> investigation, uh, uh, no, geological, so we need to see if it's feasible to even use the land first, and that's really what SWIFT um, will help us with. As we get you know, through those phases, if everything's a go, then we start looking at the um, environmental, the NEIR, um, that'll also start the initial design uh, and planning tasks, which as Daniel mentioned is gonna be, what's our approach? Are we going to build something? Are we going to use prefab, modular? Um, those, as we get to that stage, we'll be able to give you better cost estimates. But is that included in the work scope for this? It, it's not necessarily his responsibility, but he's going to guide us um, and help us get there. So it, it, it's going to be a, a team effort. And, and, you know, we might need to bring somebody else in to help us with cost estimating once we get a little further. Um. I understand they're two different things. Um, just as it's described here, that's a little unclear because it's, it says the staff wishes to retain the consultant service to potential, assess the potential project feasibility and process and risk associated with permitting 
and then it says further to assist in obtaining rough order of magnitude. It sounds like that's not actually part of this contract. He's going to help us get there. It's not his sole responsibility, no. But working with others, part of this contract will be yes, the rough order that's, of magnitude. That's the goal okay. of the first thing. Okay, it's, it's, for this purpose, it's a relatively modest contract. So I just wanted to get clear on what, was, what we would expect. And timeline for this? Uh, if, if we're hoping to get it started right away, and, uh, but I mean for completing. Uh, again, it's, this yeah. is just the very first step. So um, if I can jump in on that, Aaron. Sure. So our our goal is to get through this very preliminary look, go back to the capital committee, and if the information is positive, then we'll have to figure out what the next contract looks at look, looks like, whether we can tag onto this one or we have to go out to competitive bid at that time and get to the next level of investigation. Ultimately, what we want to do is by this time next year, have that process completed sufficient to a level in which we can go after a bus and bus facilities grant. So if we go through all these different steps and this board keeps concurring, look, looks good, we want to keep committing to this, we want to keep looking at it, we want to get it ready, and then we get to a stage where you say, yeah, that looks like it's a good project, let's do it then we'd like that to be by this time next year so we could go after a grant to fund it. Okay, and then I do not have a note of where I saw this, but somewhere I think in a capital budget I saw $12 million for the paratransit facility. And yeah, so in, in, I think it's probably in this sheet when we were putting together the capital program, we just threw a number out there. That it's a meaningless number. We we think this thing will come in way under that. Yeah. Especially especially if <laughs> that was from the unfunded capital list. It was yes. based on yes. other buildings that we had completed in the Metro Base project. Just to say we may be able to use that. I, I think we'll come in way you know, I think our rough stab at it was something like half of the cost of JKS, but we don't even need half of that. So it'll be a lot less. Yeah. It, it's yeah. really dependent on stick built prefab modular where that falls. Yeah. Dr. Rothwell. So you're talking about the current lease possibly being pulled or not renewed? After about two years. After two years. Are we going to run into a problem here where all of a sudden they don't give us a renewal and we haven't found a, haven't completed the project to move it? We sure hope not. Potentially. <laughs> but, but I mean, but it's, it's, it's a deadline. It seems like it's coming. really, really close. Yeah. What do we do? Do we have a backup plan if we don't have to finish? And they do pull the lead. Do I catch on the senior? CEO would like to answer that. <laughs> yes, so, so staying with my two, two year horizon, turning the first shovel to uh, ribbon cutting, and this process alone taking another, a year to get ready for a grant, assuming we get an award of a grant. That's three years right there, and you can all already quickly do the math for one year past the expiration of our, our lease. So first line of defense is that if we've got a grant, we've turned a shovel, we're making progress to try to get the landlord to extend it the additional year. That's first line of defense. Second line of defense is that we have the possibility, at least in the short run, of relocating it back towards the Vernon area. So as you may or may not know, we own a little house on some property adjacent to the maintenance facility. We're looking at ways right now to find funding to demolish that structure and create sort of a tarmac there. Uh, it's not a long-term, it's not even a medium-term solution, but it could get us by for a year. Why, is, why are they interested or possibly interested in not renewing it? Have we done a bad tenant? I think they have a higher and better use uh, for that property. And isn't there some hydroponics uh, adjacent to it that uh, needs more space? Yeah, they're right next door to us. Yeah. There's a better crop than a better crop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> less parking intensive. Yeah. I do think parking is an issue there. Parking, yeah. We have 36 okay. vans that we're, we're actually parking in the empty shop area inside the building because there's just not enough parking. Yeah. For the record, I didn't say what they're growing. <laughs> Okay, um, any other questions? <clears throat> Anyone? Oh, I was scared. Anyone from the public like to come up? Come on, come on. Uh, 
I just wanted to make a few comments on, um, really, I'm excited about uh, uh, to hear you guys discuss it and, and just to see the, the, uh, the sense of urgency. Um, and I just wanted to uh, say a couple things about that facility that I've been, you know, I've been working there for 10 years. And uh, it, throughout the years, it, the issues have been the same and we probably should have been out of there quite a while ago. Um, there's, uh, walking in the, through the facility, just walking in the front door, the first things you can notice is uh, the, the trails leading to the different areas of the office where you can see it's gotten years and years and years of use. And no matter how much we, we clean, no matter how many deep cleanings they make of that carpet, those trails are, are they're, they're there. Um, and it, uh, Added to that, a few years ago, we had a, a pretty severe mold problem um, that took a long time um, with the landlord to actually get it fixed. And it wasn't just in our section of the building. It was, it was throughout, throughout the building. Um, caused partly because of uh, leaky roofs and partly because of, uh, of uh, uh, plumbing issues. And it seems like we got all the blame because we're at the <coughs> bottom end of the Everything rolls downhill, and we're downhill from everything. Um, uh, just last year, a tree fell on one of our vans, and it took them uh, almost a week to finally take down the tree. And so, from the, added to the parking issues, we lost three spaces that we could could park in. Um, and the parking issues that the plastic company across the way from us, uh, they have tons of temp workers and they all park there and it's not only created uh, a pro more parking problems for us, it's also uh, as the drivers, the, uh, the workers who are parking there are now competing with parking spots with, dare I say it, some bad drivers. Uh, and there's been, there's been, uh, my car has taken several um, several hits, and it, I'm just parked there, and it's them getting coming in and out and forcing their way in, and uh, it's it's cost it's caused more cost on 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 the workers who work in that building, um, it, and it, Daniel can attest to this. Once a year, or several times a year, anytime we have some rain, we there's the lake lake factories. Oh, that, uh, that back that back corner there it fills up and that takes seven parking parking spaces away from us um, and uh, in, yeah, I just wanted to add to add to that and just to um, just thankful of the 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 experience and the sense of urgency you guys have to get, find a find a solution. Thank, Thank you for the visuals. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else like to comment on that? I'll go ahead and bring it back. Oh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'll see you right away. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, I just wanted to, really, I'm asking questions, but since I don't think I can ask questions, I'm just going to kind of blob the questions over there. Um, my understanding of Jonathan Swift Consulting Services is that they have been a long time. Uh, consulting firm and development firm here in Santa Cruz. And um, I heard uh, Director Rockin say something to the effect of they don't want to put out bids on this project because it'll help financially quite a bit. Uh, again, I just want to urge this board to understand that we are at a time when every single land development project, especially projects that involve transportation and the public needs, uh, we have an opportunity for tremendous creative potential. And uh, a landscape architect and developer such as Mark Lakeman, who has done just incredible work in Portland um, at over 300 intersections throughout the Portland community and who also designed the public commons there. Um, it's the kind of landscape architect and developer that I hope that our city and this board are going to consider. Nothing wrong that I know of with uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Swift Consulting, but I just want to say that this, the design of public spaces like this can just make a huge difference in the tone and attitude, the functionality, and the sustainability, the, the uh, artistic and creative sense of a place. 
and I hope that this decision to, to use the Jonathan, Jonathan Swift consulting firm has been one where you considered and, and really went out of your way to look into other very creative firms. And just to also say that I am a little concerned and sorry that, I'm, that I am sort of uh, perennially uh, somewhat maybe suspicious is even an okay word to use here, and I apologize for that in the sense that it's not always pleasant, but I get suspicious when the same developer is used over and over and over again in a city, um, and I feel that, that, that our city could be extremely creative if we were to consider other uh, kind of environmental design and creative sustainable uh, architects and landscape architects who exist out there, so I just hope that that this hasn't just been one of those decisions because that's who you know and and he and this person in firm can do a good job because this is a tremendous opportunity uh, that could really create a, a vibrant and city space even though it is a transportation space. Thank you very much. Thank you. Anyone else from the public? I'd like to bring it back. I'm point out that this is we're not hiring someone to develop this project but to do preliminary research. It actually requires knowledge of the local community. So hiring a local firm is both cheaper and uh, probably better for us in terms of the outcome. Um, and the fact that it's under ten thousand dollars total for the project is this is not the same as hiring someone to design the landscaping or the shape of the building or any of these kinds of issues. So I will move the staff recommendation. Second. Motion by Rothman, second by Matthews. Any <coughs> discussion on the item? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, before I get to the next item, I have one additional uh, director's comment. Uh, Director Rodkin has a comment. I can go ahead. This is just an announcement. Uh, tomorrow morning, Saturday at 10 o'clock, um, at the police community room in Santa Cruz, our uh, CEO and general manager, Alex Clifford, and Guy Preston from the RTC will be giving a public talk on transportation in Santa Cruz County, uh, its present reality and future possibilities. So I want to invite the public to participate. It's free and open to the public. It'll be 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, and that's at the intersection of uh, Laurel and Center Streets in downtown Santa Cruz. I want to thank Alex for doing it, and I think the public would benefit from hearing from these two directors of the two most critical transportation agencies, what's our future look like in public transportation. Thank you. I'll go to... Um, and I, if I could, one more comment. Oh, go ahead. I'll just throw in here, Alex gave his uh, annual presentation on state of the system, or whatever the official name is, to the Santa Cruz City Council uh, at its meeting this week, and it was really informative. And um, for those members who don't regularly come to Metro meetings, I think it gave a, a really good idea of uh, accomplishments and challenges. So thank you. Great. We have a meeting tomorrow. Okay, I have a review of items to be discussed in closed sessions. Mr. Clifford, or Mr. Chairman, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just an update on labor negotiations. The board will not be taking any reportable action today. Okay. Is there anyone in the public would like to address any item in closed session? Seeing none, we're going to have the closed session in this building, so we'll ask you to go ahead and uh, actually work your way out. Thank you.